All right, welcome everybody to the e April 6th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. As everybody is aware on the call, two things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy. Um, and then the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. Sorry. Um, so for announcements today, we have a Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you have something that you want to include in that newsletter, please do leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked from the agenda. Um, as Rye pointed out last week, uh, it, it's very important uh, that if you have something special going on in your projects that you do um, take the time to include that there so that people are aware of what's going on. Uh, so then what we have for quarterly reports, we have the Caliper report that came in. I uh, hadn't had a chance to look at it, but I think the last time I looked at it, there were two people left to review that. Uh, so if you haven't reviewed it yet, please do so. Um, yeah, and then uh, for the BASU one, uh, there are quite a few uh reviews that have happened so far there was a question in the report itself for the toc about the um i think the cicd and if we were going to be um delivering a unified cicd strategy across all hyperledger projects um so i know we've been talking obviously about github actions and some best practices uh, but I did want to make sure that we were aware of this question that was asked um, and see what it is that we might want to just respond to the BASU group so that they know what's going on. Yeah, Arun? Um, so, Tracy, I know the leadership team is in con constant touch with GitHub on GitHub Actions. And also RISE doing experiments on um, how to give visibility into the build time so that we are also going to suggest on optimizing the build pipelines for PR sources merge things. Do you think it's right time to call out those things or do you think we are we can discuss those later? Uh, so yeah, I think we will we do have in the discussion a topic for the GitHub actions. I think it's worthwhile uh, for the BASU report, maybe just to let them know that those discussions are underway um, and that if they'd like to uh, find out more, they can listen to some of the past recordings to see what we've been talking about in, in those areas. Thanks, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, then for past new reports, the Transact one, um, Peter did open up an issue and a pull request this week, two days ago. Um, I haven't seen any responses from the Transact maintainers on that pull request or that issue. Um, so I think the uh, I think we'll give it another week, but I, I think if we don't see any sort of responses coming up uh, to that, and then we should uh, consider potentially opening opening up a ticket to uh, end of life transact. Thoughts on that? Concerns with that schedule? Sounds good to me. Okay, great. Thanks, Arno. All right, and then for the URSA report, uh, we did. Uh, Stephen, you sent a reminder the last time we met uh, out to the URSA group. Um, however, I don't, uh, I didn't see anything unless it's been uh, responded to today uh, that have, has come back. I think you um, sent it to Brent, and my understanding is that maybe Brent's not working on the project anymore. So we may need to figure out what to do moving forward with URSA. Where did, um, did you hear that from Brent? I know I heard that third hand. Okay. It's hard to tell. I mean, Jen doesn't say much about what they're doing at all. Um, he's been in and out 
and tends to respond and then not respond and then you know process some PRs. So I'm never quite sure. I've never heard specifically that they're in, out, or doing anything, doing or not doing anything. So it's really hard to figure out. So unless you heard it firsthand, I would say let's keep pursuing them and see. So IIW I you should answer this. All right. So that's what we've got for project reports. Uh, upcoming reports are cacti and fabric are due next week. Um, any questions or other comments on the project reports and the projects? I got a reminder about the indie report. Um, is it should it not be on the list? Maybe not. I got a <laughs> Can we open up that calendar, Ryan, and see what the... Not that I need everyone else to do this, so sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, just say, there was an email there I saw at the top uh, that said it was due. Oh, May 4th. Oh, okay. Here I was thinking, it's... It's like, this week. Send it a month in advance, I guess. <laughs> you can always send more, Stephen, if it's... I, I will. I will. Don't you miss it. <laughs> well, I have the reminder set for one week in advance. So, oh, so it's That's May funny. 27th now? I mean, April 27th now. Ooh. Well, I mean, the, the report is due on the 4th of May. Of May. Right. And I send a reminder letting people know hey, your report's due. Okay. By I send, I mean the list automatically sends without my intervention. Yeah, yeah. All good. Sorry, I didn't mean to spend time on that. I could have looked at myself. I apologize. It's okay. Stephen, just uh, and for everybody, FYI, what I do is when I go through and create the agenda, I look at the project update calendar and whatever's due the next week, I, I put in the upcoming reports um, so that people are aware that something's happening. So like next week, uh, I won't put anything there because there's nothing due on the 20th, but then on the 20th one, you'll see the Sawtooth one show up um, as being due on the 27th. Um, and the, yeah, then I'll also remind about Aries Indian and on creds coming up. So I just, I basically look at this calendar and put whatever's coming up on the um, agenda so that people are aware something's supposed to be happening. Okay. Uh, so any other questions or comments about the reports? No, okay. Um, so next we have our discussion items, two topics. The first one on GitHub Actions, an update there. And then the second one will be our task force discussion. So Rai, shall I hand this off to you? Sure. Uh First, I, I just want to ask who the other Hyperledger project is and perhaps they could change their name. Oh, it's Ben Thomas. All right. So uh, we got put into a beta group at GitHub, which contains both historical data. You can look here and see that this job, like in uh, February of last year, took 46 seconds to execute. And if you have a more complex job, uh, you, you can see that if you go to the top, you can look at the summary and see, you know, all the dependent jobs and then, you know, all of the, all the errors. And then you can see the, the usage. And this is broadly available. Um, this is on a per run basis, um, not a org or repo basis. So this is very helpful, but this data will need to be aggregated and it's not easy to get. So uh, I just wanted everyone to know I'm working on it. And if anyone has questions, you know where I live. Thanks, Ray. I think the information will be useful for those of uh, us who have jobs that are running long um, to see where time is being taken. Uh, yeah, like this one here. Um, 
So definitely take a look at your actions and the, the usage and see if there's anything that you might be able to do to speed things up or um, update those actions. Yeah, Arno? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask Rai a bit more, but so what kind of aggregation do you actually want to do? Per repo, per project, per all of the above? I don't know. Right. So I, I want to have, I want to see, like I want to be able to go and look at Hyperledger and see how many minutes we've used. And then at a repo, how many minutes they've used. And then at, at a job, I mean, that's fine. But oh. one thing that this doesn't show, and I was told going into the beta that it's not part of their uh, roadmap, is this doesn't show uh, the builder type. And it also doesn't show queue time. So I would like at least to see a queue time. How long was this job waiting before it got picked up? And that data is, you know, not really easily available. Yeah, Arun? Right, so I have a few questions and probably a few comments, right, to ask, and I want to understand this more in detail. I know now we are concerned about the build times because the, um, let's say the cost associated for CI pipelines are now going to be based on how long we are consuming the resources for. But at the same time, I don't think so. We should be that descriptive in, in telling projects how the CI pipeline should look like, right? So there should be flexibility in for them to choose what kind of tests they would like to run and what kind of validations they would like to make before merging a PR or after merging a PR. And um, do we, uh, again, so being not that descriptive and being not uh, that open because it's now charges just a question and understanding do you think we should come up with policies around um, the minimum set of things that we would like to have as part of any um, pipeline or like for instance um, the minimum things that we would like to at least write down saying that if your pipelines are going to take this long then follow these recommendations uh, follow uh, there is a guideline or help available from the hyperledger to help with you and and help create your pipeline which is more optimized so i i'll uh answer i think your so i this is this is something that hart has been discussing for a while and we've been discussing how do we uh allocate money um based on ci costs um and that would allow there would be some incentive there for projects to keep their numbers low so that they had plenty of headroom if you're a graduated project you get whatever a thousand dollars a month if you're an incubating project you get 500. i don't know what those numbers are going to be um i definitely like these jobs i looked into them these jobs timed out uh downloading the yarn cache so obviously the yarn cache was a detriment to this job success. And I haven't looked into like the Roja Island one to see how much time there was spent on the yarn cache. Um, you know, I, I don't care that much. I was just, I found out this morning that, or yesterday that we had this and I started looking around. Um, as far as policies, we do have, um, we do have some options. Um, for actions, uh, we can mandate required workflows. And we're not doing that. Um, and we we could set that to be something, um, but I don't know that that's a great idea. Um, Hart? Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and say basically that I agree completely with what you've been uh, saying and going over um you know we have been talking to github and we have been trying to get more resources uh but you know eventually we we are going to you know no matter what pretty much we are going to have to place some limits like right now the there is essentially no incentives for people to write efficient tests uh 
Um, and so, you know, we hope that like, uh, we hope that if people write generally efficient tests, then we should never have any resourcing issues. I'll go back to Rai or Rama. Rama? Uh, this suggestion probably we can make to maintainers. Uh, I mean, most of them probably already doing this, but uh, if there are multiple, if they've configured multiple actions, each of which are repeating the same setup steps and then just running different tests, you can just bundle them up into one test and uh, that would save a lot of resources, I think. Sure. I'm, I come from a CI CD background you know, both at, well, Qualcomm and Microsoft, I spent a lot of time on this. And uh, there, there are a lot of best practices that we could do, that we could mandate, like we Hyperledger. Um, but that would mean uh, for that to be practical, we would need people who are committed to doing code reviews of all the CI CD stuff. And we have 100 and 50 active repos right now. I just don't see that as uh, tenable. All right. So, um, sorry, two topics. One, I want to ask and understand more of what Hart just mentioned, but um, the other nitpick question rather to understand is on the report that you were showing right i think there were two columns right one was the build time other one was chargeable time so billable time so it was can, uh, can you explain what that is the second column sure um so these right now we're running uh free right so we're running free actions um so there's no billable time However, if you go into our billing and plans, you will see that, uh, oh, it doesn't show you. Uh, we only get 2,000 uh, a month, um, 2,000 minutes a month, but we are well over that. Um, this was one of the bugs that I had complained about uh, in our call with GitHub. Is it, I don't, I can't tell you how many minutes have we actually used what platform. I can't tell you. So that's why the number is zero. Rune, for the questions or? Right. The thank, Thanks for explaining that, right? And the other question, or rather trying to understand is what I just mentioned. Um, so Hart told about incentivizing projects based on how efficient their pipelines are. Do you think this is something we should discuss as a TOC or is this something uh, which, um, yeah, that, that's just a question. So when, when I think of it from a TOC standpoint, I don't say anything else we can say other than saying that I don't think so we sh from a TOC are right in allocating how much each project should be using. Maybe we can talk about how much a graduated project is given preference versus others who are trying to help set up. But rather I would mostly focus on uh, the optimization part of it and giving enough assistance where needed. Uh, right, maybe not like all to all the 150 repositories, but we should have uh, something in place to help the projects in case they need one. Well, I agree. The discussion is ongoing. I, I don't have the answers today. Yeah, okay. and just maybe Dave, before you, you jump in, um, I wanted to point out a couple of things that I think, uh, one, we've been doing it in Dave's best practices um, where we, we went through the CICD um, and what might be good best practices for that. The other one was that the other, one of the other task forces that was suggested was a CICD best practices um, task force. And, and we didn't get enough people signing up to express interest in that. Maybe that's because this hadn't happened yet. Um, maybe that one would have been a priority had we um, had this already going on. So I, th I think there are, 
you know, some things that could put potentially fit a rune into what you're suggesting is, um, you know, in those task for two, those two task forces, right? Um, we could spend some more time on that uh, and, and talk about kind of the guidance that you're suggesting that we give to projects on what they should do with with CICD. So, Dave. Uh, first, just a question to Rye based on the comment about we're well over the minute limit. Was it 2,000 minutes a month? Is that what you said? Or, yeah. And how could that be? Are they just not enforcing that? Right. So and this is. Do, do we expect them to start enforcing it at some point? Well, we were well over the limit for runners. Uh, you know, we were way up well over the 20 runners at once limit forever and then with no notice um they started enforcing it and that's, right, what, that's it what i'm getting at if yeah. if they start enforcing this we're going to be really feeling it right yes so i i don't have an answer i'm very much interested in an answer um i couldn't get them to say anything about anything yet um we are uh talking to them next week um about what programs are available. One that might be available is an enterprise plan. Um, but I experimented with an enterprise plan last week uh, on one of my test orgs, and it didn't give any better visibility or control. CNCF uh, is an enterprise, and all of their uh, orgs are under that enterprise. So if we had an enterprise, account we could say put fabric in one in a hyperledger fabric org and then you know we could cap the spending for that org but yeah so that's kind of we'll go to my next point is and i'm not saying we should do this but in theory couldn't we put every project in their own org and then each project would get 20 runners we could there are other downsides to that as well Okay, so when we when we talk to GitHub, can we say this is what we might do, but could we compromise instead? If could you just maybe double the number of runners? So instead of going from twenty free runners to two hundred some free runners, could you just go to twenty from twenty to forty something like that? I don't know if they have if they have mechanisms to do special cases, but I I, I will absolutely ask. Um, our call is next week, so I. I promise you this has been at the top of my mind since everything went crazy. And uh, I will report back, I promise. Okay. And then my final comment is of, of the prior conversations about leasing projects and required workflows and things like that. I don't think we should do any of that. I think we should leave it up to each of the projects. I, I can speak for Fabric. I know we have some egregious use of CI that with a lot of overlap and running across different platforms and running similar functions and different tests. So I know there's some egregious use that we'd plan to streamline. Um, and I suspect other projects are in the same boat. So I think we can get things down a lot without really bringing in uh, too much impact to the projects. Sure. What? Um, so when I was thinking about uh, required workflows, uh, to me, something that would go in the uh, in the workflows would be uh, the DCO bot, right? Uh, I don't see it anymore. Um, you know, or or something like that, or a spell check. Not, I, I that doesn't replace, as far as I understand, um, how uh, you know if I were to add a workflow here, it says it it runs alongside the repo and branch merging uh, workflows. So it's not a replacement, if that's yeah, okay. if that's what it sounded like. So I'll put this link in the TOC, TOC chat. Yeah, my main point, I guess, is that I think Fabric and I suspect other projects can do a lot to streamline our CI use. Um, and as we said last week, when everything was free and there was no limits, that you know, led to a lot of a lot of bloat in CI. There was no penalty for having redundant um, workflows and things like that. So, I think we can do a lot to uh, to reduce it while you're doing your work with GitHub. That's all. That's it.
Thank you. So practically speaking, when they enforce the limit, what does that look like? They just stop launching runners or? Yeah, that's what happened. Until uh, when? I, Until I guess the, about the, the minutes would be the more, more concerning one if well, they the start minutes, enforcing that. It, yeah, so they're already enforcing the, the runners. Um, and that's what got us into, you know, where we've been for the last couple of weeks, right? Yeah, but that means the, it's key, gets queued, right? Right. Right, so but if they that, start enforcing the minutes, then they could just say you can't run anymore for the rest of the month. Right. Exactly. That's what I'm trying that, to that get That would be to. extremely that's problematic. Really bad, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I'm... I, I agree. Um, when I, one thing that I could do is put us in an enterprise plan. Um, you get a 30-day trial. But when I did that on my test org, um and i didn't see what i wanted they they have a thing that says when you leave the the free trial everything will be just like it was well that, that wasn't true <laughs> um and i had to go and manually undo some things um and i think if i were to you know go here and click the i want a free enterprise trial button and in 30 days, we didn't come to some you know, configuration to let that happen. When we left the trial, there would be a lot of manual work to undo going into the trial. So in an emergency case, I can start a free trial that'll give us 30 days if they start enforcing the actions minutes. But that's only gonna give us 30 days, so. Yeah, but don't do that preemptively. That is great if we really need to do that. Yeah, and, and and my my thinking is that it's the only reason that it would stop at two thousand minutes is if you put some sort of spending limit on this account, right? Um, such that you never got charged anything. Uh, otherwise, you're going to actually incur cost would be my guess right like i would expect them to basically say okay 2001 now you're starting to get charged for the the usage right and when i explored this with my other org um you can't it, it's not easy if we were to go to team it would be four dollars a month per user and we have way too many users that would only give us you know this says it's free for public repos but i don't know what that means if we're capped at 2000 minutes a month you know another thing that we're going to run into is for github packages we're way over this 500 meg limit um so i don't know if they're going to start enforcing that at some point so there's I wouldn't have given this any more thought this year until they turned on the runner limits and caused chaos. So now I'm very concerned. This looks key to me, not just on the GitHub Actions part, but also on the packages size, given the number of projects we have under the same organization. Um, I'm talking with respect to even the enterprise plan that they're showing. Well, um, let me see. So packages, uh, I'm trying to see where it was that I found the, uh, I don't remember where I found the, the usage per repo, um, but we were, so let's take a look here. So here are the, the repos that are that are over the cash limit. Um, you know, Aroha is using 23 gigs of 10, Aries is using 20 of 10, you know. So I don't know if they're going to enforce that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I have so many unknowns unknowns at this point. Peter? Uh, I'm thinking about disabling the cache 
and the cacti, CI jobs, because they had this bug for months where they throttle the bandwidth of the caching operations to 0 0.0 megabit per second. And that's one of the reasons why we have jobs in the CI that are stuck for six hours before they time out because all it does for that six hours is downloading the cache with this uh, dial-up modem speed. And uh, and then it just times out and it never even finishes it. So I recommend everyone else also looks into that if, if some of your jobs that time out are because of the cache. Thanks. I had noticed that yesterday or this morning when I was poking around at the long running workflows that you, some of the cactus jobs were running for over a day of compute time and it was just waiting for the yarn cache to repopulate. So. All right. Any other comments at this point? I think Roy is on top of knowing that there's a lot that needs to be looked at and understood. And um, I think we're, we'll continue to get reports from Rye as and when he learns new information. Thank you, Rye, for the update. You're welcome. All right, so I think the next thing is a task force discussion on the security vulnerability disclosures. Arun, uh, this one is uh, for you to take on, take us through it. Thanks, Tracy. Hey, everyone, um, thanks. I mean, so uh, yeah, before we get started, I think I wanted to recap what happened in our previous discussion because that was about three weeks ago. From now, uh, the previous discussion that we had was on 9th of March, and that was an excellent call. I would say we had various topics on that day. We discussed a lot about policies that we can enforce uh, from within Hyperledger Foundation. We discussed about the embargo list. We discussed about the activities that uh, the project representatives can are supposed to do within the security. Uh, for uh, subgroup that we were talking about. Um, and we also discussed about some of the ways we can uh, inform the security researchers when they, when they impose or when they report uh, their issues. And that was a good discussion. So I would say the, uh, please go and listen to the recording on 9th of March if, it's, if, if you missed the previous discussion. And I know um, towards the end of the call um, on 9th of March, we had two open topics which were not completely discussed, uh, which we are supposed to um, discuss. And once we have uh, these two topics as well, I'll go ahead and put all the suggestions that came in through these meetings, the task force discussions through PRs. And I also see uh, Hart uh, posted a link on Google Doc. Yeah, it's Hart. Hey, so thanks. So I took a bunch of these suggestions uh, that from that meeting and put them together into a uh, sample template for a vulnerability disclosure list. Um, so you all can take a look at that. You know, um, I finished it up last night, so I apologize for not sending it out in advance, but it wasn't done. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to try to write something that was based on the open SSF document uh, or, or sorry, the open SSF doesn't have a document. I wanted to make something that was based on the open SSF recommendations, uh, but still, you know, customizable for different projects. And the idea is that the projects could just edit out like the stuff in red and the stuff in brackets here and have a reasonable uh, vulnerability disclosure policy. Um, that being said, this is a first draft, so I probably made a bunch of mistakes, uh, so it would be really awesome if you could point those out to me. Um, 
Ideally, I would like to be able to take this back to the OpenSSF vulnerability disclosure group and have them also give us uh, an okay on this. Uh, and then, you know, we, we can go from there. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't expect people to have, you know, lots of immediate comments on this uh, because, you know, I, I literally just shared it. Uh, but, you know, please, you know, over the next week or so, uh, we, we, we'd, we would love to have your feedback. Um, are there any immediate questions? Anyone? Um, no, I think we need to read through uh, this and then go back to meeting recordings and then map them if we have missed anything. Thanks, Hart, for putting this. I know um, we also discussed about creating a governance subrepo under TOC um, for putting these guidelines. Yeah, I mean, we might also contribute this back to the OpenSSF um, because they don't really have a template that you can use for a vulnerability disclosure form, right? They have a bunch of information on what you can do uh, as a policy, but they don't have like an example policy a project can just take and pick up. And that's what we're trying to do here. it's also customizable in a lot of ways that projects need customization. Like for instance, I know Besu has something like six or seven possible bug intake uh, routes. But most of those, the other, our other projects are not gonna have. Peter. Getting through the document, it looks great. And uh, I think we should use this in Cacti for sure, especially the, the part about the response team that has at least three maintainers. So thank you hard for putting this together. This looks great. Well, thank you for the kind words, but I'm, I'm sure it needs some edits. So <laughs> please, yeah, take a look and, and you know, Particularly folks like Arno, who are security conscious. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Arno. Uh, no, no, it's okay. I, I will definitely have a look. Um, but yeah, so so what I'd like to do is to get the folks in this group okay with this, and then go back to the Open SSF with it. Um, So th that's the plan. I think that's a good plan. So interestingly enough, OpenSS have just uh, developed a disclosure policy, but it's the other way around. They describe how they will handle vulnerability that they found in other people, in projects in general, in other projects typically, because you know, there is, some activities in OpenSSF, you know, is uh, focusing on trying to secure open source at large. Right. And so they have a list of what they consider to be like the top uh, projects. And they just try to, you know, find vulnerabilities across the board. And they figured, well, it'd be good to actually explain our policy, how we will handle the disclosure of vulnerabilities that we find through our activities. Yeah. But it's kind of the opposite of this, right? It's on the other side of the spectrum. Yep. And we have a lot of projects that have custom, uh, that, that have, a, there, there's a lot of need for specialization. Like I don't even, I don't think I know all of the possible 
Besu intakes, right? Um, so. Yeah, if I mean, I guess it's not fair to expect people to, to come in on this now, but, uh, you know, please read it over, comment, you know, feel free to reach out to me and ask me questions, Discord or email, whatever works for you all. Um, and yeah, we, we can go from there. But I also see you listed down the private batch deployment infrastructure. I wanted to bring up the topic for discussion today one more time um, because we spent less time in the last call. So, sure, go ahead. I mean, it's it's your your topic. <laughs> you're you're the leader here, so go for it. And no, I think and the, the, this is good. So um, yeah, this is what I wanted to bring up in today's call that we did discuss about the uh, private patch deployment infrastructure where we raise PRs and do the development in a in a a private manner, which is not publicly disclosed. And only when it is merged, it's available to the public. And all the testing for the issue itself would happen on that private branch or private patch. Um, and I wanted this to be a guideline for the projects uh, that something like this exists and something like this is what we encourage for all the projects to follow, especially when it comes to the security um, issues. And it would also go in as a, a guide for projects and best practices. So, um... And, and, and if all are okay, then maybe we can we can um, do this, talk about this in, in uh, best practices as well. The other thing I wanted to bring up in today's call for discussion is on the governance of these these policies that we are going to set up or governance around the best practices that we have put up from a security standpoint. The reason why this plays important role is um, we want to incentivize projects that follow best practices from a security standpoint. And we want to build the confidence for among the users of Hyperledger projects. And we want somebody who's using Hyperledger projects to know that these projects are vetted through the strong guidelines and strong recommendations. So they are following a high quality, at least when it comes to the security practices. And they can be ensured that uh, there is no compromise when it comes to security. And we want to avoid risk, uh, which might arise in, in, in uh, when, sorry, let me put it in a better phrase. So we want to do a risk management. We want to make sure that uh, in, in, and unforeseen consequences, the impact is uh, minimized, the, the uh, issues are minimized. So we want to make sure that at least our governance rules have best uh, practices around those, uh, around those issues so that we reduce the blast radius, right, um, in, in our worst case. So we need to have that infrastructure in place and, and, and make sure at least the the projects are ready to be used in, in critical software environments for any of the use cases that we have. I know there are a few certifications that some of, I mean, at least a couple of projects that Daniela mentioned that Hyperledger projects have gone through uh, for use in governments, at least in US, right? So that's another reason why we need governance. Now, apart from these, um, I know hard uh, brings in high security caliber, I mean, high, highest importance to the security because he himself being a security researcher. So it's also a focus from the foundation that we need to put up best practices around it. And um, 
having said all of this, right, we want to minimize any extra work to the maintainers in just putting additional, I mean, without putting additional burden to them on um, how we get these measure, how we get these measured. And at the same time, we don't want any of these reportings to be available in public, right? And, and but we still govern that these projects are following the best practices that have been recommended. So um, that's the gist of why it is important and how we should play around it. I don't have any uh, proposal put up in place, but what I want to bring up today is if anybody have any recommendations or, or considerations on how we measure a success of a project uh, when we have all these governance rules put up. And I want to also um, talk, talk, I mean, tell that we are not really ranking projects among, like we are not comparing one project with another project and we are not ranking them based on how well the other project or how bad the other project is doing. But rather, let's consider this as a way of measuring how good a particular project is, right? So without in comparison to another project. So there is no comparison needed across project, but it's rather imagine it to be like an absolute um, rating that a project can achieve when it comes to best practice. And this is an open uh, question, which I would require comments on, is Tracy. Uh, how is what you're suggesting different than the badge? Um, used to be the CII badge, I think it's now called something else. Um, how is how is what you're suggesting different than that? Um, sure. So from CIA by I mean the the best practice um, guidelines that were there, it focused on few uh, questions that were to be answered by each project. And I don't think it covers all the aspects that we have um, in our recommendations in terms of, for instance, let's say we have a recommendation that says um, the project maintainers who are sub who are supposed to be responsible on the security side should be responding back or at least try. They should try age and say if a reported issue is a security vulnerability or not within a given amount of time, right? So there is no way of us measuring if that's being followed unless like it gets escalated or unless it gets told to us or unless somebody monitors it from the foundation. I mean, that was just one um, example or one scenario which we sh we can consider. It's difficult to measure. Or I think um, one of the thing that that came up in the previous task force discussion, not this one, the previous security task force, is that assume that all projects are um, having the good intent in, in terms of making sure all these recommendations are followed, and then assume that they're all following the best practices unless somebody raises a question, right? But that won't give us the accurate measure or if uh, there were no incidents that, that were reported for that project. Peter? Yeah, it is hard to define some sort of regular check for this that doesn't turn necessarily into a chore. We could we could measure the number of reported vulnerabilities, but then that's that creates the wrong incentives because 
if a project has more reported vulnerabilities than another, it could just mean that more people are using it or more people are researching what the issues with it are. So ultimately, it could actually be that it has a better security hygiene. And then... Maybe some sort of uh, crowdsourced uh, checking process with the main within the maintainers. So crowdsourced within the maintainers, where every month the security responsible or the security response team of one project could go and check on another project and then report their findings. So that way, someone else would sometimes at least look at what the other maintainers are doing. And so if if there's one project that who, who's doing a lot of uh, sort of mistakes in terms of security, then it would get noticed sooner or later. Like, it's this is as much as I can uh, figure out for doing something that is not too intrusive and also doesn't take too much time away from from everyone all at once. Instead, it could be just a round robin kind of thing this month it's this maintainer is doing that project next month is some other maintainer doing some other projects and then of course it could be on a volunteer basis so that we don't just throw every maintainer all at once into the mix but only those who feel like they they can spare a little bit of time and if they feel like they know enough about security to take a quick look, which is not much. Uh, but yeah, it would probably have to be an opt-in thing. And part of the first thing for this to at least to even evaluate how successful it would be, we could just uh, ask the maintainers in sort of a referendum or survey uh, would you actually be willing to volunteer to do this and then if we get I don't know if we get 10-15 maintainers who say you know what I wouldn't mind doing this once a month uh, on some other project so that others will also do it on my project then I think that's that's a start course if, if we don't have any volunteers then that's a different question crazy yeah i wonder like two things one are we What's the goal of this? Is it just to, is it to determine whether or not they followed the processes for a CVE or a security issue that was reported? And if so, why, why is that just not part of the process, right? Like, why is that not just part of, once you finish, the, the work to figure out the security vulnerability and report it if necessary. One of the things that you're looking at is the date that it was reported, the date that it was closed, and if it's over the 90 days or whatever the number is that we decided on, then, um, then we need to have a discussion at that point about why that was, why did it take longer than the 90 days, what could be done differently, um, and move forward from there. I, I just feel like we're we're making this a, maybe a bit more complex than we need to. And, and maybe that's just because I don't understand the reason that we're trying to uh, do this work. 
about it. So um, quick quality, uh, thanks for that question, right? So quick clarification. Of course, we don't want it to be a policing mechanism. I mean, it, it, we are not a police here to do certain things. Uh, the only reason why I wanted to bring this topic is uh, so that we increase the confidence in, in hyperledger projects and we can claim that these practices are followed and the um, users of projects um, have assurance that there is high standards of quality uh, when it comes to security. Um, I agree that like, some of these information we can um, extract from the reports, but then we need to just be clear on who does that and whose responsibility would that be. Any thoughts on that in, from anyone? Uh, sorry for not raising my hand, but it seemed quiet. Um, yeah, I think we wanna have some metrics around, you know, uh, it, it, if a project is not, you know, following responsible disclosure practices, you know, do we want to invest in like security audits and, and other things for them? Uh, you know, maybe not. Um, so, you know, we want to have some incentives for, for projects to follow uh, best security practices. Um, you know, I, I don't know how punitive we want to get. And, you know, certainly for, for labs or, you know, certain projects in incubation, you know, it, it's probably not as important, right? So we will need some flexibility here. Um, due to the nature of this, these reported issues, right? Should it be um, the staff who extracts this information and probably they make a decision? Uh, you know, we can. Sorry, go ahead, Peter. Uh, if, if, I think it's automatable that part of it. The uh, the, the part that Tracy said uh, whether we are over the 90 days for vulnerabilities or not I'm pretty sure that part can be automated and then it could just run as a job once a day or once a week and then generate a list of over the findings and then uh, send that out somewhere posted on the discord channel or in an email to the mailing list Okay, I will note that we are over time. Right. Um, yeah, we can continue this discussion in offline as well. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you for attending, everybody. We will see you again next week. I think, uh, Bobby, you're up next, if I'm not mistaken, with the task force discussion. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody.